First, though, Kogan clocking a record first half result with profit rising more than fivefold to $8.3 million. Revenue also up 46% driven by customer growth and investments made in inventory and marketing. The online retailer declaring an unchanged, fully franked interim dividend of 3.9 cents per share. For more on the results as well as the outlook and the discussion more broadly about the changing nature of retail, I'm pleased to welcome Roslyn Kogan to the desk, of course, the founder and CEO of Kogan.com. Roslyn, thanks very much for joining us. Look, great set of numbers, but in terms of the outlook as well, also doing pretty positive against a retail environment where we see so many faltering. What are you doing that's getting so right? Well, we've got a long-term strategy that we've been implementing uh, over many years. We are a business that's been around for close to 12 years now, wow. and we're a data-focused e-commerce company. So uh, some retailers are now introducing private label and exclusive brands. We've been doing that from day one. We're an exclusively a private label business. We've been uh, running a data-driven business that knows exactly what consumers want so just and on is this, able to deliver it. And on that, because we were just speaking off air, you described that the business is a, a statistics business masquerading as a, an e-commerce retailer. How, like, what are you doing? How much sort of data is driving your decisions at the moment? Well, we like to think that every single decision we make is driven by data, whether it be what products do consumers want. And we look at uh, Google search data that determines where the trends are, what products to allocate capital to, what are people interested in. And your search history doesn't lie. <laughs> you know, if you look at it, whether you like it or not, it's a very accurate representation of you. So we're getting data from Google and saying this is what people want. We're then uh, able to deliver those products. We're then able to know what consumers want and give them additional services and uh, things. And it's building a huge base of consumers. And we're going through a watershed period in our business. But think about then the products that you've introduced relatively recently, so health insurance with Medibank Private, mobiles with Vodafone, travel products, general insurance and so forth. Is that largely, Ruslan, being driven by the data feedback you're getting from these Google searches? Is that, or is it a way of augmenting and leveraging that, the customer yeah. base you've got? All, it, it's augmenting and leveraging the customer base that we have because they're all mass market. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't need Google data to say people make lots of phone calls and they have a mobile phone. Um, they're, they're mass market utility services and we announced our NBN launch which is coming soon also with Vodafone. But essentially we've got this huge stream of traffic. We've got a big trusted brand online that stands for price leadership through digital efficiency. And as a result of that, we've got a very low cost of acquisition. And we're launching into these new verticals that have a huge cost of acquisition, have huge competition and huge consumer demand. And we're able to form these partnerships with the Vodafones and the Medibanks, whereby by lowering the cost of acquisition, we can provide a better and more compelling deal to the consumer. So it's a win-win-win. Uh, the customer benefits by getting an awesome deal, our partner benefits by having a fast-growing division, and our shareholders benefit as well. What sort of margin, though, I mean, expectations are when you go into some of these new verticals, particularly when, you know, the, as you say, that the key offering you bring is, is that brand name, but that brand name that's, that's driven essentially on low pricing? Yeah, um, the margin profile of new verticals differs. And uh, the thing for us is that we structure these business units in a matter where we do what we're good at, mm. being a brand, digital marketing, customer acquisition, and our partners do what they're good at. And they have often built a big, they've had a big capital expense to build out a service or product. And, you know, Vodafone runs a mobile network. They're brilliant at it. They're one of the best telcos in the world and one of the biggest telcos in the world. Whether marketing and branding arm, we don't know how to run a telco network. Same with our partnership with Medibank. They've, they've got the, the book, they've got the risk, they, they know how to provide a, a healthcare service, we know how to acquire customers very well. And that's what makes a beautiful partnership. When you do what you're good at, your partner does what they're good at, and combined, uh, you're able to make money from that. It's not a dissimilar, I suppose, to essentially like a lead generation machine. You know, you add it to a Medibank private product or you add it to an insurance product. Question is then, you know, how many other segments or other product lines do you potentially, are you potentially targeting out there at the moment? 
Yeah, so we've proven through Kogan Mobile how well uh, this can work, and that's going gangbusters. You mm. can see that in our results. We've got these relatively new verticals that we've announced. Some have launched, some are still yet to launch, like NBN, which is a yeah. huge opportunity. And NBN could not be a more perfect market for this business model because you've got a government-mandated switchover in a utility service that everybody wants, needs, and is going to use more of and you're in a position to provide a market-leading deal on it. And that's the ingredients for one of these verticals. It has to be something that's mass market. It has to be with a uh, significant professional partner and typically an industry with a high cost of acquisition where we can leverage the brand and customer loyalty that we've built for over the last decade uh, to make it a win-win-win for everyone. By moving into the, some of the verticals, Ruslan, does it sort of acknowledge that you've reached, if you like, terminal velocity in terms of potential growth for the traditional own brand business, you know, the electronics and consumer goods? Well, uh, I think numbers speak far greater uh, than um, any words I could say about that. And our private label exclusive brands division grew by over 40% mm. half on half. So. Uh, you know, it was one of the reasons for our IPO. We knew that private label and exclusive brands do require allocation of capital. They mm. do require investment in inventory. And we knew we were leaving a lot on the table based on the data we had uh, prior to our IPO. And we did the IPO and we didn't even... We, we knew it would improve, we didn't know to what extent. Like in our first six months after listing, we outperformed our full year prospectus forecast. And now the half that we just announced is cycling that half. And not only did we significantly outperform that half, we, we outperformed in the first half our full prior year in terms of EBITDA. So uh, the numbers speak much louder than any opinion I would have on that topic. In terms of competition though, how much has, has have the, the recent past been an element of a free kick from competition that, as you've stated many, many times, have been quite slow to sort of grasp the changing nature of, of retail. I mean, you talk about da data analytics. I mean, that's, that's an opportunity available to, to any business. And I just wonder, as there's more and more of a focus on some of the things that you do well, whether or not that opportunity is going to start to, to shrink. Yeah, look, there, there has been a lot of stories about the retail landscape recently and I think that when Charles Darwin described evolution it applies a lot in business as well when he said it's not the strongest that survives nor the most intelligent but the one most responsive to change mm. and uh, that is something we really value in our business the ability to make objective decisions the ability to not use emotions and look at the data and the facts for what it is and adjust our business based on what the customers want because the only way any retailer or business can flourish is if it delights its customers. Amazon. I, 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 to confess, when you know, the announcement they were coming into the, the Australian market was made, I initially thought that Kogan would be a likely victim. Uh, I mean, we've just seen the share price continue to push higher despite the, the announcement of, of Amazon. And then to hear your comments, I think it was at the AGM, you actually welcome the arrival of, of Amazon because it grows that, that online pie. Just talk to us about your thoughts of the, the impact it's going to have, not just for your business, but retail more broadly here. Yeah, well, uh, you know, go onto amazon.com.au and do a search for LED TV and have a look at what comes up. You know, it's a it's a distribution channel for anyone who has a significant competitive advantage and a compelling offering to the consumer. And we've got that through our exclusive brand. So that's one element of wel welcoming Amazon here. Uh, another element is if you look around the globe at what uh, markets that have had a big marketplace player like an Amazon for a while look like, and whether it be a US, UK, Germany with an Amazon or even China with an Alibaba, their online retail penetration is significantly greater than ours. And uh, that's, that's something that a, market a big marketplace player does. It changes the paradigm. It gets people thinking about it. It changes the paradigm from, hey, I need to buy something, let me drive to the shops, mm -hmm. to, hey, I need to buy something, let me open my laptop. 
And that doesn't just apply to products. It applies to when you need to buy health insurance. It applies to when you need a travel deal. It applies to when you need a new mobile plan. So in general, the more e-commerce is in headlines, the more impact our e-commerce companies have on the business landscape, the better. What do you think, though, of those, those retailers and you know, quite high-profile ones that say, look, we are going to fight, we are purely going to fight Amazon on price, that we will maintain our existing and, and build our retail offering, our bricks and mortar, because we want to provide the experience and we will just slash and burn prices and take them on on what they do. No matter what retailer you are, or even no matter what business you are, you have to be completely true to your competitive advantage and you have to flaunt it. You have to know why your customers are buying from you, what is it you're giving them that nobody else can give them, and flaunt that element of it. And that's not to say that the competitive advantage can change over time, uh, but you have to be very true to yourself in terms of what your competitive advantage is. And the moment you start adjusting strategies without a very clear path and without a very decisive move and understanding on who your customers are and why they're there, you run into very dangerous territory.